given $12.5 million new contract and a $50 million research laboratory affiliated with the University of Maryland called the Institute for Human Virology. So he recognizes also on the back of the flyer, in the back of the book, the name Garth Nicholson. As a colleague of his, a personal friend, Nicholson is the hero to Gulf War Syndrome veterans. He's the guy who's been really at the forefront in telling the research community the truth. And as a result, he was pressured to leave his academic post at MD Anderson Cancer Research Center, where he was Gallo's counterpart, chief man in cancer virology and cancer studies. And they both worked intimately with the special virus cancer program researchers at Fort Detrick. And Nicholson wrote, one cannot fail to grasp the explosive significance of this book and its main thesis, that biological weapons programs developed and field tested immune system destroying agents that now cannot be contained. A cogent, readable, and carefully documented book. So Gallo doesn't like that. He gets home. He calls Nicholson up. Now, I hear this second hand from Nicholson. He says, what the heck are you giving Horowitz this loon a good testimonial for his book? Nicholson responds, Bob, first of all, he's no loon. He's a Harvard grad. Second of all, have you read his book? He says, no. He says, Bob, you better read his book. <laughs> Here's his telephone number. So he gives him my telephone number. Three minutes later, my phone rings. I pick up the phone. This is Gallo. My first thought was, I wonder what the world's leading AIDS virologist is doing, calling somebody that needs a grade 101 level of biological science training, high school level. <laughs> so the first thing he says is, I want to apologize to you for what happened in Vancouver. I thought that was nice. Good way to start. He says, uh, I didn't know who you were. Garth filled me in. I understand. He says, I understand you're a humanitarian. I'm a humanitarian just like you. And I have a lot of information. I think I can help you to understand the true origins of AIDS. I said, oh, that's nice. I said, I'm very open to that. So he begins to talk and tells me about his family history. I've heard it a hundred times. I've read it about it. People who know Gallo have heard, heard how he got involved in medicine. And I got to know this conversation is going to go on for a while. So I got a little tape recorder by my phone. It's always primed and ready to go. <laughs> so I said, Dr. Gallo, do you mind if we record this conversation? He says, for what purpose? I say, for publication purposes, of course, and I find myself in the role of an investigative reporter. So he thinks about it for a couple seconds, and he says, OK. So I begin to record about another 30 minutes, wherein he lays out his chief objections to my thesis. And I want you to know, after studying those objections, they are completely and utterly bogus, scientifically indefensible, and I've got the hard documents to prove that. He would be laughed out of any scientific suppose the inquiry into the issue. Next is, when I press him, because I know the theory is sound, I press him on it, and there's this thing about Gallo, everybody knows it, he himself admits it. He's got medical science's biggest ego. And he's always got to be one up on everyone. So when I press him on it, and I say, but Dr. Gallo, don't you think that something like this was possible, not necessarily in your lab? He says, okay, I do not argue with you. I will not argue with you. It's possible. Then he says, but I could tell you even more plausibly how something like this could have happened by accident at that time. So isn't that nice? More news you're not reading. World leading AIDS expert says the epidemic might have been an accident. Nice. Well, at any rate, I sent them a copy of the book. I said, if you can make any additions or corrections, changes to update and improve the quality or content of this work, I'd be happy to integrate it into the next edition. Moreover, if you can tell me more plausibly how the AIDS virus might have evolved, then I certainly would be interested, as I'm sure so would 30 million other HIV AIDS patients throughout the world. Well, I never heard back from him until <clears throat> I called him about a month ago. And I'll tell you in a minute what he said. I want you to know that virtually everything that you know about the AIDS epidemic is a complete deception. In fact, I want you to know that virtually everything you know about everything is a complete deception. <laughs> it's true. And just to give you an example, to introduce this most horrifying segment where I'm going to share with you how the vaccine was developed 
that most plausibly delivered AIDS to the world, and who did it? Just to give you a sense of how deceived you have been, you remember the phrase, the AIDS virus doesn't discriminate? And the propaganda message is that you and I are to believe that white people get it as much as black people, that gay get it as, get it as much as straight, that rich versus poor, people all over the world, Africans, same as other countries, Europeans. Well, remember a couple years ago they even said that white women age 23 to 35 were the fastest growing risk group for HIV AIDS infection. How many remember hearing that? That's wonderful CDC propaganda, a complete distortion of the data. They twist the data, deliver it as a political message, therefore it becomes bogus science. Garbage. This is what they do. They take it out of context. Now, just to give you, present this point a little bit more clearly, I want you to know that the AIDS virus discriminates. I want you to know that the AIDS virus discriminates even in the high-risk populations. To prove my point, I'll take this from the American Journal of Public Health. This is one of thousands of studies that you can evaluate this information, the same information in. And this is a study of HIV antibody prevalence among IV drug abusers in six U.S. regions. Now, with IV drug use, what are you told? You're told that the risk is those bloody needles, aren't you? You share those bloody needles, you get a little blood transferred, virus transferred, you got AIDS. Now here, take a look at this. The, in blue is the percentage of people who share their bloody needles. In red are the people who are positive because of it, allegedly. Now, you see in San Antonio, Texas, 99% of those people who use IV drugs share their bloody works. In other words, these are the dumbest IV drug users in the country. Okay? But despite that mess of ignorance, only 2% carry the AIDS virus. That's interesting. You know, same level of ignorance almost in San Francisco, where it jumps up to 10%. And you see in Baltimore, Maryland, all of a sudden it jumps up to 29%. So, you know, any epidemiologist with any remaining common sense, now I know that in Epidemiology 101, that's one of the prerequisites, you have to give up your common sense. <laughs> but anyone with any remaining common sense might think, well, maybe something strange was happening in New York, what might that be? And you see here in Denver, it drops down again, and here you have in Tampa, Florida, far smarter IV drug users, far less share their bloody needles. No, nobody's carrying the AIDS virus there. But look in New York, the Big Apple, where you've got the smartest IV drug users in the United States. They all must have gone to Rockefeller University. <laughs> but despite that massive intelligence, a whooping 61% carry the AIDS virus. Now, anyone with any common sense would have to suggest, well, what? Something strange might have been happening in New York. What was happening in New York? And particularly, what was happening in New York, let's say, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years before the AIDS epidemic broke in 78 in New York City? But what was happening in New York? This is a United States government document. You're looking at a document from the National Cancer Institute monograph of 1974. We're in over New York City. You see what a square, that square is over also Central Africa, Uganda. And that square, according to the legend here, is liver cancer virus research. Liver cancer virus research they're studying. And you see herpes, herpes type viruses. There's a star. The stars are in northwest Uganda which is where Litton Bionetics Research Labs are in collaboration with the International Association for Research in Cancer. And in Southeast Uganda, another star for herpes type viruses. That's where Litton Bionetics' monkey colonies were. And you see the same star over Bethesda, Maryland, where Litton Bionetics Research Labs were in the United States. Herpes B viruses. By the way, how many of you remember late 70s all of a sudden you saw herpes becoming a big deal? front page of Time and Mag Look Magazine, you said, you know, herpes is a sexually transmitted disease, and who did they blame? They blamed the hippies. You know, the love generation. And then also, uh, herpes viruses, by the way, include simian cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr viruses, herpes B viruses, which now have been linked to sarcoma cancer development, and 
definitively chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, which of course coincidentally came out on planet Earth in 1978 in humans the same exact year that the AIDS epidemic broke.